Welcome everyone to Ladder Daily Digest. Today we have a special guest. Our show is Meet Maven Brody. And also with us today is Peyton Hawes of the Peyton Hawes Channel. Thanks, Peyton, for joining me as co-host as we dig in deep to the inner mind of podcaster <laughs> Maven Brody. So, so everyone, I'm the guest. <laughs> yeah, so you are, Maven is the guest today. So that's a, a change. So she has to put on her guest hat. Maven, thanks for joining our show. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks You're for having me on. <laughs> yeah. And so everybody yeah. knows that there was the uh, unmasking of Maven on Mormonism Live about 29 months ago, I'm going to say. Oh, <laughs> maybe. And then, <laughs> and then 24 months ago, Maven was on Mormon Stories. Mm -hmm. You did a part one and a part two. And the part two is way better than the part one. <laughs> so I want everybody to know the part two. So we're going to provide a link to the part two. If you want to go and see what Maven did as a 12 year old, go ahead and watch the part one, but we're promoting the, the part two. We're gonna, <laughs> so we're going to have a, a link to that. So let's see. So Maven hasn't really said much of her story except for on our podcast and occasionally here and there when she's done her own show on Bill Reel's channel. And she did a show with Peter Bleakley about Michelle Brady Stone. Otherwise, guess, yeah. we're kind of going to dig into maybe the last few years of Maven because, you know, we're going to see where that is. We could we could start off with a, maybe just to give us a brief of how you got on to Mormonism Live. And that's sort of like the yeah. beginning of your podcasting experience. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? I mean, it, it kind of goes back into, I mean, out, outside of. Mormonism is actually my I struggles with undiagnosed ADHD jobs, just having a really tough time finding jobs that either uh, that I liked and paid well. And so I worked a lot of jobs that I didn't like and also did not pay well. Part of that was just, I think, um, because my ADHD was unmanaged, it just, it was difficult to I, it, I just really internalized a lot of it and it just felt like I wasn't very smart and I'm, I'm not reliable and I'm just I'm lazy and I'm, I'm, I'm just all kinds of problematic. And so even if I had found like a career, I wouldn't have applied for it or, you know, for other like better jobs, because I just thought like I can't have a job where people really will rely on me too much to, to actually be doing anything that will be like important or make a difference. So I was really just kind of sticking with uh, customer service jobs, which are also important, but they're, I liked them because they were jobs that I could just kind of show up for, do the work and then go home. And, you know, I wasn't really actively engaged in, in the company or what was going on long term. And so I, I could be a decent employee that way where, you know, I just, I just show up and I guess also tied into it. Well, this, this is have to do with Mormonism because, you know, I was raised with the idea that I'm supposed to be a stay at home mom. And so when I, you know, everything I did in school, always just each new year that I still wasn't married and I could still continue school, just kind of felt like a, a bonus blessing. You know, I, I had hoped that I would get a degree. I didn't know that I would because, you know, if you get married, then, it, you know, if your husband's a year ahead of you and he's done and he's, you know, gets a job across the country, like your education is over and you follow your husband across the country, you do what you need to for your family, you know? And so I never felt drawn to any particular career for one, because, because, uh, you know, some Mormon women do have careers. I, I had a roommate that was a lawyer, a, a lot of teachers and nurses. And I always felt like, for, like those careers were really important. You're doing good for the community or for children or, you know, nursing. It's, it's all, all over the board. You're, you're, you're taking care of people. And God has, I was never God really... has blessed those people to do those jobs. Right. Right. And I just kind of felt like maybe that's that's their path, you know, so so overall, like the overall teaching is that women should be stay at home moms, but teachers and nurses are, are super important. And so, yeah, I just felt like that's something that was between them and God. And they kind of had like like a calling for, you know. And so as I, as I graduated and the, just the, the further I, I got, you know, past and I graduated older anyway, of course, because I left to serve a mission and then I, I needed a bit of time to save up some money to be able to come back to school. And it ended up taking an extra year because I changed majors. So I'm already kind of late <laughs> in, in graduating than the average graduate. And then it was basically almost a decade of just kind of one customer service job after another. I There would be times where I, I would think like, I need to 
I, I need to find something. I need to find a career. Like I, I need to find something that will work, that will pay well, that I can uh, just <laughs> like enjoy my life better. Cause it's really hard to enjoy life when you're not making enough money and you hate your job. It's like soul sucking. I, I think I, I did tell this story. I know I've told it before, but one of the jobs was a like a graveyard shift customer service job. And I ended up getting uh, like a, a kidney infection and I didn't notice it. Like it started to become a problem like on the shift. And I hadn't, at that point, I hadn't worked there long enough to have insurance. And so I didn't want to go to the ER because I knew that was going to be, you know, expensive and I don't have insurance. And I'm, I was making like, I think like $10 an hour, maybe 10, 25, because there's a 25 cent differential for, for the nighttime work, like, you know, big money uh, for the graveyard shift. Anyway, I was, so I was, I was hoping I could get through the shift. I ended at seven and then I was like, I think there'll be somewhere between work and home and urgent care that will open at seven and if not seven, eight o'clock and urgent cares are cheaper. So I, but I couldn't, I only got to 4 a.m. and it was getting so painful. I, I could barely stand up. And so uh, halfway through the shift, I told my supervisor like, I, and she'd seen me, like I was constantly getting up and I was getting away from the phone. So she was getting upset with me for like a, away from computer time because I was going on break or logging out of the system because, you know, I had to be open for phone calls and it was super dead. It was super dead. They didn't have a lot of people overseas that I would help. I, we got like one call an hour, to be honest. And so a lot of we would just fill in the time with email tickets in the meantime. But yeah, it, I still like she was upset that I was getting up from the computer for, I might miss that one call per hour. You know, it might go to a coworker and, and they'll have nine calls that night and I would have seven. Anyway, it was just, it was just all kinds of ridiculous. So I told her I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to drive myself to the ER because I, I think something's really, really wrong and I'm not going to be able to drive myself much longer. She told me, cause there was some, it was like a point system. If you were late for work, that was worth half a point. I think a, a no call, no show was three points or something like that. And I had, I had one point from like two tardies getting there. So anyway, yeah, she was like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll have to give you um, three points. If you leave in the middle of the shift, that's the same uh, as a no call, no show. And then that'll put you like really close to, you know, that that seven. Termination um, or whatever. So, yeah, no, because I think it was actually four points because it was putting me at five and at five out of seven, you you started to have like write ups and stuff and seven would be termination. And I, at that point, I was just so done. I was like, I don't care. You know, like, like something's really, really wrong. It was so painful. Uh, it, like even when I drove, I couldn't actually drive with my right foot because I was like, I was bent over. So I was driving with my left foot and just I don't know, just kind of hunched over like this, just trying to get I, I, that's just an example of just how kind of soul sucking some of my jobs were and then just for like not even enough to really live off of you know anyway it's um, like a but, take this job and shove it kind of a whatever yeah like. yeah i was just like you know it's just it's getting to the point where it's just like not worth it you know um and even then at the er like they were the doctors were super nice to me and everything and the doctor was worried that i had a, a kidney infection and possibly a kidney stone because i've had i've had those before so he was like, if the if a kidney stone is blocking your kidney and it's infected, like that can get serious very quickly. So I'd rather he's I, I want to do an MRI so that we can see if the stone is there. And I was just like, OK, but do we have to? Because that's expensive. I, I know that I, I was like, can you give me a ballpark of like what it would be cash? Because that I don't have insurance. He was like, I think it's like twenty five hundred. And, and that was about or more like what I made like in an entire month. So I was like, nope, can't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And he was really kind. He was like, you know, and this is where like the medical system is kind of sad because like I think he, like he genuinely felt bad and, and wished he could help, but we're just kind of stuck in the systems that we're in. But anyway, so he said he said, okay, I I'll I'll let you go home. You know, we'll, we'll, I, I prescribe some antibiotics and some painkillers for you. And if there's not a kidney stone there, it'll clear up and you should be good within a day or so. Um, but the condition like for me to release you is that if it gets worse, you need to come back. And so I was like, okay, I, I can promise that. And he's like, no, I, I think he ended up telling me like three times. If it gets worse, it should not get more painful at all. It should immediately start getting better from here on out. So if it starts to go downhill, that's a serious complication. And you must promise me to come back to the ER. So I said, okay, I promise uh, I will come back. But anyway, so, so moving on from that, I just, I, I don't know. And then I searched for jobs a lot. So a lot of times people like when... For people like me in this situation where it's like I'm struggling with money or these, you know, they're like, well, just get a better job. 
And that's super unhelpful because, I mean, if people could, they would. And it wasn't that I wasn't looking. I, I would look, and but I either just didn't qualify for a ton of jobs or I just felt that if I got them, I would be fired from them. I just thought ah, these are too important or these these responsibilities are really big. And I just I'll just end up just fucking it up and disappointing everybody. And I'll just be a big failure, you know. And so a lot of times I would get on these kicks, these kind of anxiety, hyper focus kicks of like searching for a job. And I would just come out of them like way more depressed, actually, and feeling even more hopeless sometimes. Um, and so I would have to kind of take a break sometimes for like a couple months before I would find like get into another anxiety hyper focus and, and start looking again. Yeah. I, do you have any questions from there? Um, yeah, this is combined also with your um, deconstruction, right? And so you, not you've got, yet. No, mm, but I mean, yet. it will. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. I was kind of um, feeling like I could relate to your feelings with jobs and having a certain amount of responsibilities and feeling like that was really scary. And I think I've kind of always been that way too. And I've worked for too many companies or people who just treated me or other employees horribly. And like, we're just objects in this, you know, Cog business. In the wheel. and so I've just pretty much made to this day. I will not work for somebody or help somebody that's not just really laid back and easygoing and understanding of life because the, like I work for a couple people right now. I have like nannying jobs and I help like people in their homes. I, I will meet with them and just like make sure that they're going to be understanding if like mom life stuff happens mm -hmm. or they not they're not going to freak out if I'm sick and not feeling well or something comes up like it's just there's too many companies and people who just don't treat people like people or don't yeah. understand that life stuff happens and it's just horrible it's hard it's night and day difference when you have an employer that does care and will give you the time that you need yeah, yeah. and uh like John is like that for me with uh with Mormon stories and uh with all of us, he can be really protective of uh, at, like time off and uh, um, end of mental health struggles, which has been super, super great. So yeah, yeah, yeah it, it makes all the difference in the world. They forget where I was. So you're sort of uh, like how you got into um, podcasting, right? Well, so podcasting, you're at the yeah. situation where you, you don't want to have a career. You're in kind of dead end jobs. And yeah, you think well, you I flopping I kept thinking like maybe because I, I was still thinking of it in terms of faith and like what God wanted for me and then also like because I wasn't feeling like I was getting answers that this was kind of like a faith test you know and I was thinking either you know I, I for some reason I need to go through all of this I don't know sometimes I was thinking like I just need to have faith and keep persevering and then I'll either like get a husband and then like, it'll all be taken care of from there and I, I'm just persevering to that or I need to just kind of trust God and he'll give me the inspiration for what kind of path to pursue that would be, you know, meaningful and, and, and not just so depressing and awful, you know, or sometimes I was thinking, is there something I'm not doing correctly? You know, it's the whole righteousness thing. Maybe, I, I, maybe God's not answering my prayers because I'm not praying regularly and maybe I'm not reading the scriptures enough for him to answer my prayers or, you know, maybe, maybe I do need to do more work. So I, I it, that, that was also kind of fuel some of these like research kicks. I don't know how many careers I've researched everything from like forest service to like physician's assistant and like everything in between I've I've looked at like maybe this could be a thing like a, so random all over the place I don't know just either as I would research I would just I would learn more that okay this is this would not be the job for me or like physician physician's assistant is just too much barrier to get back in going back to school you know all, all these things and just money that I didn't have I was just like I can't and then yeah I was just like nope it's not that I would never feel like yeah and so Nothing it, it called just, you no, nothing yeah. called me. So then that made me think, well, then maybe there's not a career for me. I didn't, I just was constantly kind of going back between all these scenarios. Like there isn't a career for me. It is marriage or I, I just need to keep searching and eventually God will answer my prayer. And this is just all part of the test. Yeah. Like I, I don't need to search and I just need to trust God. Like I, I don't really have to do much more anyway. It just was really depressing like year after year. And it anyway, so when I finally like fully deconstructed, 
I wasn't a little bit better place. I was, I was working um, a security job, which I did like, it, but it's still a low paying kind of a type job, but um, it, it was at least better than other jobs I'd had. And it really, it, it, yeah, I got a lot of overtime. So that helped a lot with the finances and stuff. But after that, I realized I need, like my life is mine. I need to take charge. And, and I no longer believed that there was a God who was going to give me the answer anymore. And so um, or a husband instead of a job or anything like that. I was just like, I've really, I need to take control of my life. But it still, it still took a while for me to do it because like it is hard to change. And I still kind of had the same problem of like, I still don't know what I want to do or what I would be good at or, you know, and I, and also among that, I, I would take all kinds of like aptitude tests, personality tests, like strength finder test, you know, all of those things to try. And I love that I did that. Some of them are more like pseudoscience than, but it was still interesting. It was still like, I learned a lot about myself. So it was great, but it's none of that actually helped me get or, or find like something to, to go into. And so, yeah. Uh, oh, I just want to say that it is like an ADHD thing to, to hyper-focus on things and also to lose interest real quickly. And so before I got diagnosed, I did notice that I had a tendency for that. I didn't know it was ADHD, but that was also something that really worried me was that like, maybe if I, even if I did find a job that I did actually like, and it seemed to speak to me, like what would happen if I went to school for it or something and then basically by the time I finished school or, or finished whatever training or, or whatever, I was just like, nope, I'm done with this now. Now that I put all these resources into it, I hate it and I want yeah. something, you know what I mean? So then I was like, well, if I'm going to hate my job anyway, I'll just, I should find something that's going to make money and then I, I can at least be suffering and making money. But you, you when you're ADHD, it's, it, you can't, it, it's, it's not so simple to do that. You can't just suffer a job that you hate, even if it pays a lot of money, it's, it's still going to be like soul crushing. Yeah. So anyway, so that, that was all kind of wrapped up, but um, I was still, yeah, I still didn't have like an answer to the problem. So kind of, it was actually two things. It was really the deconstructing, well, three things I would say, deconstructing from religion, getting that ADHD diagnosis, um, the death of my sister-in-law actually. So I'm trying to think kind of how they happened. So the in order first was the the deconstruct. I, I I had stopped believing in God, and so I I knew you know. So I'm on my own path now. I need to figure that out for myself. But I was still living the same kind of life. Nothing really all that much changed. And I was hiding it from my family. So as far as anyone knew, like any difference was just like in myself secretly. But then I moved in with my brother and sister in law um, while she was pregnant. So this is my brother, right, and his wife, and then her sister. So when I say sister-in-law, I'm actually talking about my my brother's wife's sister. Uh, they were both pregnant at the same time. And uh, my sister-in-law was 14 weeks along. And we just found out that she's going to have a baby girl. And it was actually my nephew's birthday party. It was during COVID. So it was one of the first times the family had gotten all together. My sister-in-law's sister didn't come because she wasn't feeling well. And she actually died at home while everyone was there at the at the party. And she was alone. So she wasn't able to get help until you know, um, it was already too late. Her husband had, had gone out to, uh, I think it was actually a church function of all things. That was really shocking. She was only 23 years old. She was only nine weeks along. So she's just a little bit behind. So she's still in her first trimester, barely. And it just wasn't what anyone expected, you know? And, and I'd she only had met already her had, time. she had already had some problems with her pregnancy, She'd right? Problems. Yeah, it was definitely a tough pregnancy, but that's kind of like normalized, I feel like in church culture, yeah. like it's almost like bragging rights about how, how tough your pregnancies are. I mean, and even Elder Anderson kind of did this when he gave a talk, you know, his, his anti-abortion talk, you know, don't have abortions, have more kids and, you know, and uh, adoption's great if you don't want the kids, you know, it was an awful, awful talk. And I think it was only actually a year after she passed, but he, he tells the story of a woman who already had four kids and all of her pregnancies were really difficult, but you know, she, she felt the spirit tell her that there was more. So she actually went through two more extremely difficult pregnancies. And now, now they have this beautiful family of six, you know, and it's just like, you know, it's, you just, you're supposed to have faith. That's the point of that story. And so, yeah. Um, you know, if you're, even though there's, Technically, and this was also before the Dobbs decision. This was before you know Roe versus Wade was overturned, and it's in the church handbook. It's and it's been there for a while that you can get an abortion for the life of the mother. Again, like just really the culture is that that is terrible. That is taboo. There's not really a pass for it. Even even if you're faithful, there will still be judgment for you for having had one. It would still be something that you, you kind of keep secret and you don't talk about um, if she had. But she would presumably be alive and she could maybe be a mother now if she'd you know gotten a, a chance to try again maybe anyway I um 
I was just really affected by that death I think because until now it's always been like grandparents people who are much older and are at the end of their lives um not someone at the beginning and and not someone that was creating a life you know at the time and so yeah sorry it's just and, and seemingly <laughs> preventable yeah if yeah all the I options think, were on the table yeah and she had she had like her own health problems too so I, I kind of wonder if um if we didn't have a, a culture that focused on our like entire worth as women, you know, being around motherhood. And if, um, uh, I mean, like it's our creation, we were literally created to bring life, you know, if it, if it wasn't just solely around that and we could, we could just be individuals. I kind of wonder if she would have had the option to say like, you know, with all my health problems I have currently, I think it's not a good idea, you know, but that's, again, that's just not, that's not really kosher in our culture. Just you, you were made to have babies and you should have them and you should have them as soon as possible and as many as possible and, and all these kinds of things, you know, and if you're worried about your health, that's called comfort, you know, so you, you just don't want to be uncomfortable or, or inconvenienced if, uh, you know, by these kinds of things. Yeah. So I just, I don't know. I just had a lot of anger and, and rage and sadness that I was dealing with. I was actually going to be telling my family because we were about to move in together I mean I was living with them in an apartment but we were moving into a house my brother and I were combining our finances so I was like I probably should tell them you know beforehand that I don't believe in the church in anymore in case that makes a difference on whether or not like we want to live together but like when she died it just it was bad timing so I just I kept it under wraps but um that was really what spurred me I think just realizing how short life is and anybody can go at any time and so even though it's it's not going to be by pregnancy for me, like, you know, a car accident could take you out or, or some random like heart defect that you didn't know about, you know, that, that gets you in your mid thirties, you know? And uh, anyway, I just, I felt, I really felt just the time that, that we only have one life. This is all I've got. There aren't any do-overs and I, I don't think that there's an afterlife or it's certainly not going to count on it. And so that's where you I was like, I have to, you want to start living life now instead of too, yeah. living everybody else's expectations. Right. Mm -hmm. Or even without that, just thinking like later, 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 things will be better. Later, I'll, I'll find something, you know, you just get caught up in the day to day that you just forget. And it's just normal. Get up, go to work, go home, sleep, kind of, you know. And I just thought, yeah, there's got to be more to it than that. So what I finally, so I, well, first I started looking, you know, what are, what are good jobs for people with ADHD? They would list, uh, there would be these top 10 lists or whatever. None of them, like, first of all, I'd already researched like a majority of the, if they did list specific careers. One was computer programming. They're like a lot of people with ADHD. And I was like, I do not like that. That's like, it's super boring to me. So I, I don't get that. If they didn't give a list like that, almost everything said, like, follow your interests that's the only way like it can it doesn't matter because everybody's ADHD is differently and what's interesting to one person with ADHD is not to somebody else so there really is no set like these are the ADHD careers it's it's got to be something that you're excited about and passionate about um but again like ADHD hyper focus is a thing where you could I could be interested in lots of things all the time and sometimes for not very long so I was like these this still isn't helping so finally Finally, I decided to fork out some money for a career coach. And it was for, um, her name is Shell Mendelson. I'd love to put her uh, information and, and links down here. And I did group coaching because coaching is really expensive. You know, I'd done things before. Like when I did my research, there, there were times where I did actually pay money. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, it almost always seemed like around $800 for whatever course I would do. I think I'd done that twice before, like two different courses. And then by the end of it, I was already like burnt out of it. So it, it never went anywhere. But this, it, again, it was a, a yeah group coaching thing and it was like $800. And I was like, I really hope that I'm not just yet again, throwing my money after something that is shiny, that I think is going to help and is going to solve all my problems and is going to be perfect. And then only to, you know, <laughs> come at the end of it and just be like, nope, I'm, I'm no better off. Luckily for me, though, this was the this is the right thing to do. So she uh, I guess I'm trying to think like how much to go into it. I guess before I do that is are there any questions from like up up until this point? I just relate so much to everything you're saying. I, 
Do you have a, a diagnosis or like, an, are you, do you know if you have ADHD? I don't have a diagnosis, but the more, um, like the mom for one of the kids I'm nannying and becoming really close with her. And she's like becoming one of my best friends right now. And she mm -hmm. has diagnosed ADHD and OCD and I have OCD diagnosed like, and it's very severe. Mm. Um, and so a lot of times when I go in and I talk to doctors about these things that I'm experiencing and I, how I start a million things and I'm never finishing them and I just can't keep. And like when I have stimulants, it kind of actually helps me to focus on like the one thing I'm trying to focus on mm -hmm. and like calm my brain in a way where and so I'm like I swear and they're like no that's because of your OCD and because you're a mom and that just happened no one will let me even no. like tested and I'm like oh. dude I need help <laughs> like somebody because everything you're saying I'm like oh my gosh I've done that I've like done all the personality tests and like what career is right for me on Google and I, I hyper focus on like so many things and so everything you're saying I'm just like I totally get you. Yeah, I I recommend if you can just advocate for yourself and really try to get that because there's a lot of things that ADHD is misdiagnosed as, especially in adult women because people aren't looking for it. I mean, there at times in my life, I especially when I was younger and in school, it was I struggled so much in college. Now because I I know because of the ADHD but I had a ton of anxiety and depression. And so I did go to, they, they had a free school counseling. So I went to counseling for that and like nobody ever picked up on that. And so it's just kind of like the really symptoms of the cause, you know, I, I think OCD could be part of that. Cause I, again, I'm, I'm not a professional. So I, I think you should check on that, but I can definitely see how mismanaged ADHD can lead to maybe compulsive behaviors as a reaction to try to control that yeah. and manage it yeah so what so to get diagnosed because I, I I had researched enough to see that it was kind of a battle online so I I, I found um, a center and for me in, in Utah it was a serenity mental health centers that have a specific I was looking for a psychiatrist trained in ADHD I didn't want to do, just go to a generic one I wanted like an actual ADHD person yeah. to test me and and it was like really really high so for you and for anyone else in the audience that is maybe relating to my story, sometimes you really have to push for people to, to take it seriously. I, I definitely recommend that. And then if you are struggling with a career, I do recommend the career coach I had, Shell, because what, what she was able to do with the activities and the program that she worked through was um, kind of help see that when you like w one of the activities we did was to kind of think back on memories of like, it, it times that we oh see now now it's been too long and I'm figuring out how to how to word it uh, kind of like key moments in life where we were really proud of something we'd done or 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 really you know involved in in a project or something you know uh, and just things like that that just really and and you really do have to go back to your childhood a lot of times because that's kind of the time period that it starts getting stamped out of you a little bit or your expectations are. are being managed by the adults around you rather than, you know, what's really truly in your heart. So going through those and, and writing them out and, and then kind of analyzing what, what was it about this thing that I enjoyed and how was it reacted to? Like what kinds of, you know, because we talk ourselves out of things. And a lot of times things that people with ADHD like are, it's, it's usually not accounting, you know, or like, you know, obvious, like stable, steady jobs like that. A lot of times they are in the creative fields, you know, like this or writing or, you know, art, music, these kinds oh, of things. Okay. Yeah. And so they're, those are like the specific kind of jobs that adults are, are usually like, you can't make money in that. So, so give up. So that's my whole I, childhood. Yeah. I loved painting and writing and singing. And my parents were like, you got to pick something that's going to make you money. Like these yeah. are just hobbies they're not jobs and I'm just right. like okay I or love it, maybe a job, like you have to be at such like insane levels that you know because you know there's tons of musicians out there so like oh my, yeah. it almost sounds maven like you're blaming ADHD on bad parenting <laughs> blaming ADHD on bad parent no I would because you're, you're saying the coach was saying go back 
to your childhood mm -hmm. to see like where your parents stamped out. Well, it's not even, it's not the parents, it's everybody. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's all of around you. you. You say it to your ward, you say it, it's like your teachers, it just uh, all adults really. That's that's kind of the prevailing thing. So okay. I um one of the memories had been just like a little two minute video I had made and I had just taken this class as one of my electives because um, I had I had a slot that I needed to fill in and none of my like core major classes. Yeah. So I, I had to. And, and so I ended up it was like film 101 or something like that. And it was the first time I ever managed a camera and I'm still camera settings like ISO and shutter speeds and all these kinds of aperture. I, I learned them enough to like regurgitate it at the time, but those things just really go over my head. But still it was, I, I went on a hike with some friends. It was super slippery. It was rainy. We fell like a million times, um, but we had a good time. And I just put it together to, I made a little music video to it and I put it together. Um, Louis Prima, Pennies in Heaven. And I just, yeah, just, it, and I just really kind of uh, cut to basically all the times we fell down. So it was just this, it's a song that goes like, every time it rains, it rains pennies from heaven. And it's it's just kind of an upbeat song, you know, shooby dooby. And then it was just falling down, falling down. Me and my friends, just all of us over and over and over slipping in, in the mud and, and just laughing it up and stuff. And I, I had, I spent hours on that and I loved every minute of it. And so I was like, I wonder if I could do something like this, but especially then like YouTube was a thing, but it was super early and it, and it was really just kind of homemade stuff. And so, yeah, I had no idea like this. So I really, I just felt like, no, I can't because there's either like independent film artists, which everyone knows are starving artists, you know, um, and you have to be really passionate and, and dedicate a lot of time for like no money. And so that's not compatible with motherhood, you know, so that's a no go. Or you just, you have to be so dedicated, you'll be to be like Hollywood level, but that's also time consuming and not conducive to motherhood. Although it would make a lot of money if you can get to like X tier or whatever. And I was like, I probably won't because I, I'm just starting now. Like there's, there's just way more, it just, it would never happen, you know, anyway. So she, what, what Shell was able to do with these stories was kind of help basically filter among all the hyper fixations that people with ADHD can have. There's certain things that will stay consistent. And what she was able to do with these, I, I guess, coaching like snapshots. sessions. Yeah, just kind of get that those things to filter up to the top so that, you know, and the other stuff, you know, it's like when you, do sand and dirt and water and you shake it up. It's just kind of all mixed. And then when you let it settle, like the heavy stuff settles at the bottom, the light stuff floats at the top. I don't know if that's a good analogy for it, but that's kind of what she did was, was to help anyway. So I had a, a personal session with her. There was she, like part of the group coaching would include two personal sessions. So as we were going along, we got to the point where it's like, okay, it's time for your first one. Now bring me some ideas of where you're thinking you'd like to take your career. I had thought by then, like, I think I want to, talk about deconstructing the church because that was still a really big thing for me mm -hmm. and um, I'm starting to get into all the other podcast Mormon stories and uh, Mormonism live RFM all of that and so uh, TikTok's, I, going, TikTok's are going crazy yeah I don't I don't think I was watching a lot of TikTok that because I, I knew that that would be an ADHD trap so I resisted TikTok <laughs> for a long time um, I and I yeah I'm kind of there now where I, I don't watch very many because it, it still can be really really, really time consuming, but I was on Reddit uh, a lot and I would listen to the podcast. I just wanted to do it. I think too, also just being, feeling really silenced for most of my life. And part of that does have to do with my family, just like almost never listening to me, like talking over me. And even, even after I got my degree, just, just really kind of treating me like I'm uneducated. Like I can't have anything to really like give to a conversation, just the, the men in my family, especially like they know everything already. So there's, there's no need for them to listen or possibly learn something from me. So I think there was just like, I just wanted to express and get out. But I also thought like, but it's really hard to get into podcasting. You know, again, all the same things, like it's hard to make money in it. And that's all true. And then I thought, plus I, I'll get over it in a couple of years. It seems like most people deconstructing from the church a year or two. Um, now I say, I think it is more two to three, but I, I just thought like, I'll, I'll be done with this in two years and I'll, I'll want to move on. So like, I, anyway, so I, I started saying this, I was like, this is one thing I thought of podcasting, but it's no good. Here's some other like more realistic ones. Let's, I, you know, it, we had 30 minutes. So I was like, let's not waste time with that one. Let's focus on these. And she was like, no, let's, let's focus on that one. I, I want to focus on that one. And which was brilliant, honestly. And so she started telling me there's more you can do than just starting your own podcast that is kind of a tough way to go but 
podcasts are huge and they're growing. And, you know, even if you're not the speaker, there's still tons of stuff you can do, tons of, you know, all kinds podcasters, of production. Podcasters yeah. need help. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of work. And especially like you can you can work for like bigger podcasts that that do these things. You can be behind the scenes and, you know, and so, yeah. So she's like, I think you should look into it. So I, I did start to learn more about that process, but it's still like really brand new. And I'm listening to Mormonism live. I, um, you know, Bill would have technical issues or he had, uh, he, you know, he wants callers in at the end of the show. And so he used to just have them call in like a Google number. And so he would answer it on his phone on air. And I think he would have it like on speaker. Or it would be connected. Eventually he got the equipment to connect it, but RFM couldn't hear it because he was, you know, in a different state. They're not in the same like studio together. So Bill would get the call and then like rephrase it for RFM. He would have to hang up with the caller because a real conversation couldn't happen. He would rephrase it to RFM and then they would speak and then he would wait for the next call. But that can come in at any time. So it would get interrupted, you know, and he'd be like, okay, hold on caller one second and then just have them on mute while they finish the discussion and then bring them on. Anyway, um, there'd be that or sometimes technical difficulties. And, and they had a call so for help. Yeah, every once, every every time something like that happened, Bill would say, "Like, hey, if anyone in our audience knows how to fix this or they have a solution for it," and I'd heard that multiple times, and I was just like, "Yeah, I'm sure there's there's got to be someone that knows AV stuff and and will totally call in and help them out." And so, yeah, there was just one day, um, and even when I started the podcasting stuff, I just thought, "I I don't know anything. Like, I'm just barely learning things. I can't help. Maybe in a couple of years, if no one else stands up." But there was one day. I don't know. I guess if I was still Mormon. I would I would have called it like the spirit because that's how it felt. It really felt the same. Bill had asked for help. He's like, if anyone knows how to fix this thing or if anyone knows how to make it so I can take calls that RFM and I can hear, um, you know, let me know. And it was just, I don't know. I just no, knew. Done it. I just felt like it's, I'm going to do it. I don't know how to do it, but that's just a minor detail I'll figure out later. Um, I am going to be the one to figure this out. I'm going to research it. I'm going to contact Bill and I'm and I'm going to get this set up. So, I guess there are a couple like other kind of little steps in between. I had I had someone that had a a roadcaster which is, you know, one of the things uh kind of a, a really beginner friendly little sound studio thing that can connect, you know, your microphone and and that allows you to play. I was able to uh, just playing around with it. I was able to like connect my phone via Bluetooth, I think. So I was able to call my mom and then also play like a, a video on the, um, you know, on the computer and she could hear it through the computer and I could turn it up. You know, I was playing with the little dobs that, you know, um, or knobs, that's sorry, the little knobs and buttons and everything. I just had so much fun once I realized like, you know, I can put this up or I can take that or I can bring in all these like multiple sources of sounds together. And I can also like I can mute my mom so that just, you know, you can just hear what's on the on the screen and then bring her back in. I was just like, this is so fun and and just amazing. So that was just the, another moment where I was like, I like this. I it was really get your, engaging. Get your creative juices flowing. Like what yeah. else can I do with this? Yeah. yeah. And did you did you know Bill Real at the time personally? Or were you just yeah, you were just a, a viewer. Just a viewer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They're they're okay. like exmo celebrities to me, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's funny to talk about now. Yeah, so I had actually met Bill once before, but again, still just as a viewer, and I don't think he remembers this first meeting because I'm sure he's met a, a lot of people. And so I went into the pawn shop where he worked because it's kind of ironic that the pawn shop he used to work at um, didn't exist when I was there, but it's in Hurricane Utah, and that's where I graduated high school from, and everything. We were never there at the same time, but yeah. So I just went in just to say like, "Hi, you know, and I'm you, a fan." I, I was super nervous Maven, and everything. Yeah. You you had to drive a far distance, didn't you? Um, I was in the area anyway. I think because okay. I because I still have friends and family down there. Yeah, and so since like I was going down there, I was just like, I think I'll go into the pawn shop and I'll, I'll see if Bill's there, and if I, you know, I'll just, um, and then I, was, I don't know, I was just really shy, and then also he was working, so I didn't want to be like too I didn't want to inconvenience him too much like at his job about his side job thing he was doing you know but yeah I just went in and I just wanted to say like I appreciate the podcast and all that 
So um, yeah, it'd be fun. it'd be interesting if he remembers, but I, I doubt it. I think a lot of people have come in and said hi to him in the pawn shop. But anyway, it was just a few minutes. That was it. And I left feeling like the biggest idiot in the world. You know, <laughs> it's, I was like, I sounded so dumb. But oh, well, I, I met Bill and I, you know, that was nice. So I, I started doing some research, but I, I went ahead. I think I, oh, I called, I called the pawn shop to, to get a hold of Bill and to at least try to ask him a few questions just just to kind of get started on um and I didn't even know like too many to ask so I yeah I think I just just to get the conversation started to see what kind of like parameters I was looking for I don't know I think I was just looking for a jumping off base like um, you want to know wanted, what you want to know what yeah yeah that's I had what I just after, you know and so I wondered like does he have one too because that's helpful but if um, if he's got something else, then I'll start gearing my research to whatever that device is, you know, anyway. So, yeah. Um, and it's funny because uh, when you call and you ask for Bill, you know, there's he has gatekeepers, of course, because you can't have fans just calling all day, every day. And so but at that time, I was I was an executive assistant. So I was the gatekeeper for <laughs> execs above me, or at least ones that tried to go through me. Um, and so, yeah, I, I knew what to do. So I, <laughs> I just, I got past the gatekeeper. I got to Bill and I was like, hey, I want to help you solve your problem. And uh, and it just kind of went from there. And then we started emailing a little bit. I, I found a, a program. I started testing it out. Um, and then, you know, I called him. We started testing it out. And then there was a thrive, I think, that happened pretty soon after. And so that's where I met RFM for the first time. And then Bill again. And just, you know, just to say hi. And um, yeah. That's how that's how I met him. And then I started to be on the show, I think, shortly after that. Right. Because your story is that you said, um, yeah, here's your solution. And you should mm -hmm. also have a call screener. Yeah. And that screener. should be me, you said. Basically, I uh, I was really hoping because I didn't actually know. Bill wasn't saying I'm looking to hire somebody. So I thought, you know, I, it might be that I. I set this up for him and then like, that's it. And then I'm, I'm still working and learning on my own, but, um, and especially cause they have like, it cost it was, it was going to cost us a little bit more to have another person on, but I went through several of the past episodes that he had done just to see like how long uh, he had, was on with callers. And I calculated the price difference between like, if he had had this system set up and then if he had it with the auto screen, um, or if you had it with, you know, a manual screener behind the scenes and it was like a dollar or two, like for the last, you know, four episodes, you know, a month's worth. And so, yeah, I, I just kind of pitched it to him. I was just like, you could do an auto screener or, or you could have one. And uh, if you, if you did want to do that, I, I definitely think it should be me. <laughs> and I just, I, in my past life I would never have been so bold as to have been like you should hire someone and I'm the person for it because I had so much like wrapped up around just feeling incompetent like for any job you know so I mean first of all to have the guts to call and be like I'm gonna fix your problem that I know absolutely nothing about you know I didn't say that last part but I you know just to decide like I'm gonna fix a problem I'll, I'll figure it out along the way um but yeah but then to be like you know if, if you want a screener I'm available and uh, but yeah, that's he was like, no, I would I would love that. Yeah, it just it was just so like, was, I know it was fun. What from was there. your well, first actually, day like the first day you did well, you wanted me to be behind the scenes, like on the very next step before we even had set up the, the call screen stuff. He he wanted me to be on and be behind the scenes so I could manage like the slides and things, because if you watch some of those early episodes, because Bill was doing everything, there'd be times where the conversation kind of lagged or, or died down because our pen would be speaking but bill wouldn't be hearing because he was concentrating on pulling something else up so things would falter or our pen would have to repeat himself or there would be this awkward pause yeah so that was also going to be part of it not just screening but also having these uh materials ready and, and doing the slides or you know pulling up documents and whatnot i was super nervous but he was like let's just have you on the next one before the call screen and and you can do the documents and i was i just i was that was the point where like the fear of failure came again. I was just like, what if I suck so bad that Bill's like, never mind. Thanks for that. Um, we'll just keep, you know, our and I, we've got it. I've got it, you know? And that so was the do um, or die moment. Yeah. Yeah. And so he was like, no, I think you can do it. And so he convinced me to do it. And then he was like, and uh, you know, he's like, do you, do you want me to give a name out or something? And I was so 
worried about it not working that I, I didn't want him to give any name out at all, like not even a fake name. I was like, if this is the first time, let's just do one trial run. And then if you like me this time and I'm going to stay, like, I didn't know that I would stay beyond the first time. I just really wasn't. And so, but Bill was like, no, I, I really want to give credit to, to someone. And I was like, can we just, just leave it nameless for now? And so, so he said, okay, he would. So, and so he did, he just said, I've, I've got somebody who, who called and is, is helping with the show today. And I was just a mystery person. Like nobody knew anything at all. Any, I could have been any age, any gender, like nobody knew anything. And then, um, you were someone a had typed, guy. I could have been, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, someone typed that this, this new, uh, tech maven needs a, a, a nom de keyboard, which I thought was a, a funny take on nom de plume. And I'm definitely not a tech maven, but I just, I liked how Maven sounded. And so that's where I pulled it. I said, you know, that'll be my name. Cause at that point I still hadn't come out to my family or anything. And I, my first name is not like too uncommon, but it's also not, it's not like Ashley or Amber, or, you know, one of those I, I, that there's or a lot Mom. of. And so, was, yeah, I kind of thought that, uh, yeah, it would be easy to trace back to me even with just a, a first name. So yeah, so it was, that's how I became Maven. And how long did it take you to become Brody? Did you stick Brody on it? Oh, just really when I, I started to make like a Facebook page um, mm. or or like signing up for account, I think a Gmail and stuff. And and sometimes it would require a second name. And I was like, Hi, I don't know. And maybe if I'd had more time, I would have come up with something else. But I just I just stole on Brody's last name. Um, she's the writer of No Man Knows My History, which is you know one of one of the first comprehensive. Uh, and still highly regarded and highly cited uh, biographies of Joseph Smith. So, um, yeah, she was she's a really cool person, way ahead of her time. Awesome feminist, like, did really great things. So, yeah, I so that's where I just stole Brody from. Cool. Sorry, I, you, it's easy for me to talk, so I you don't have to. No, ask yeah, me. so I love it. I, I think that uh, also, like the first time you talked, what, what did that feel like? You like. Like, did Bill say, hey, we're going to share your voice? Um, I don't remember. I, I know that um, I came up, you know, with the little the little avatar first so that, you know, I wouldn't have to have the, the camera on. So I don't I'll have to go back maybe to those old episodes. I don't remember the first time I came on just as a, yeah, a voice. But, but I mean, did, did they say, hey, Maven? Go ahead and and if you want to talk, show up and, and give us a point. It must have been. Did it have anything to do with women? Was it? Was there a reason why they oh. wanted you to to have I think a, they, like I think a they get a woman's me, voice on? I think they had me pop up just to kind of introduce myself once I was more established. And again, I was still I was hiding behind the avatar, and that's that's also where the purple hair came from. I my little avatar. Um, I gave her purple hair. The first I, and. That might have been it, probably, to to give a female perspective. And uh, when I first came on, I was really primarily behind the scenes. And and again, being not out to my family yet, that was where I was most comfortable. So even speaking behind the avatar was pretty nerve wracking for me. Um, cause my voice is really recognizable. I was like, if people know my like, they'll know that it's me. I had to be kind of coaxed and invited to share some things at first, and then when I finally told my family that's when the the unmasking maven where the first time that i i showed up online and and shared some of my story and it's really embarrassing to me now actually so like i almost don't want that one in the show notes it's really cringy when i look back at it it's just but you know you're, it's, you're not it's a very good stuff. judge of your own character maven I think I've done better like in later things, but I was so nervous that people weren't going to like me, which is not what happened, I guess. Thankfully, um, uh, people were fans like from the get go, I think very understanding. And yeah, so I, I feel like overall it went and really well. And somehow RFM decided to say, you are amazing, Maven. And he said that the, the amazing yeah. Maven became a thing. Yeah, yeah. he that's something that he would say. And so when I was, again, this was back to when I had been on a couple of episodes or behind the scenes, at least on a few, and I wanted to start interacting. But I, again, like my Facebook page is under my real name. And so I was like, I need to create a different one under this name so that I, you know, um, and especially because I didn't want to accidentally out myself by posting something 
on my main profile that like all my family and friends would see that, you know, there was ex Mormon. So, so I, I came to trying to come up with an email and stuff. And uh, like Maven was already taken. I think I already had Brody, but I think maybe Maven Brody was already taken. Um, or maybe I hadn't come up with that then. Anyway, at one point I just put in the amazing Maven and that works. So I was like, great, great. That'll be my email address. And then it didn't occur to me till later till I had to start giving it out, like how like egotistical it sounded. I like, that's what I would think about someone if they're like, yeah, you, you know, you could email me and, you know, at, at the, the wonderful gene at gmail.com, you know, it just kind of sounds like I'm the best, you know, like, um, but I just, it just like, it had, it just, I think, um, of course I do say, close, you know, I do, amazing. I do amazing. say at, at every wedding I've ever been, I've been the best man. Oh yeah, <laughs> that was there. <laughs> there you go. There's our dad joke <laughs> for the episode. But there you go. Um, yeah, and so yeah, now I yeah, I just I just own it, and and it's it's like it, every time I give it out to somebody new, that especially if they don't know anything about me, I'm just like uh, I hope they this might be poisoning the well a little bit, but it it's fine. Um, I'll say one thing here too that just like you were waiting for someone to help Bill with the problem somebody's got to do it right somebody out there is knows what's going on and and knows the problem and, and just is going to call him and help him and it just didn't happen right the same thing happened for me i thought maven is so amazing somebody's gonna help her do a show somebody's gonna do that for her <laughs> and maven and i had connected and we talked about doing like TikToks or something like that maybe someday yeah. doing some creative things but since we're both sort of ADHD, like the, the something flashes in and then it quickly it's gone, right? Because a bird flies by or something. And so I don't think have so many ideas. Maybe Peyton, do you under I bet you probably relate that I I think I'll we can generate a million ideas like from now until Sunday, but sometimes like focusing them down and prioritizing. Gene's still better at that than I am. And ultimately yeah. the only reason why we have a show is because of you, Gene, and you actually putting in the work to put it together and actually getting it started. Yeah. And Maven and I had talked for a long time about things and it just, everything sort of was like swirling in my brain. And I came up with ladder daily digest somehow. I think I used AI and my son, Derek helped me Suggestion. give us 10 names of a good new podcast in the ex Mormon world or something like that. And, we, it didn't come up with Latter Daily Digest, but I, I, from different hints, it helped me think of Maybe what might be good. There. And Maven yeah. and I had talked about how there are a lot of podcasts out there, and they're like more every every day, you know. And so we thought we're still working on, on connecting and yeah, getting more on. Uh, Peyton, it looked like you were going to say something. Yeah. Oh yeah. Is that about ideas? Making, it was just making me think about um, my. I was just telling my husband the other day that I love, I have so many ideas and I have, I love sitting down and filming and creating the content. And I'm like, but I hate everything else. Like, I just wish I could just show up and everything mm -hmm. is set up for me and I don't have to do anything and I don't have to edit or even contact the editors or do any, I don't want to do any of that. I just want to show up and sit down and just talk and do the content and have other people do everything else. Cause that's the part that's the most overwhelming mm -hmm. having set everything up and think about editing and even the thumbnails. Like sometimes it sounds like fun to me and I want to do it. And other times it just sounds like, I uh, just wish there was just one made and I didn't have to do it. And it's just like, yeah. it's <laughs> weird. I'm like, yeah, that. there's so much, there's so much more to podcasting than people think, mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. like, Oh yeah. Who couldn't just, turn the camera on in their laptop and just start talking or their iPhone or whatever, yeah. you know, and there's, yeah. you could do that, but you're not going to get a lot of subscribers, but there's, there's a lot more that has to go into things like editing and things. And yeah. and that's, that's how I found Peyton. Cause I was on the hunt for new podcasters who out there is doing a podcast that would be really interesting to, you know, highlight them on our show. And I found Peyton like eight months ago. And I don't know if I, I friended you and I don't remember. I was thinking, well, she's not going to want to come on our show because maybe at the time you might have had like more subscribers, you know, or something like that. But eventually we got you on a, a few. Uh, what was it? A month and a half ago or something like that. Yeah. And it's been great, yeah. you know, 
and and yeah. and Peyton has now joined the team as a as a sometimes co-host along with Sheena Peterson, and so we're hoping to you know do more and grow. We're we're growing. We're trying to figure out this business. We're trying to to do all these things. And thanks, Maven, for coming all the way from Corvallis, <laughs> Oregon, to sh- come on our show. <laughs> and um, Would you say Oregon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. She's, oh, she's, Maven's living in Oregon. <laughs> Thanks everyone for watching. Um, I'm think I'm going to call this the making of Maven Brody. And there so, because there's a lot more details of behind the scenes of all the different things that sort of had to be a piece, right? They were all yeah. a piece of the Maven puzzle. Yeah. They all kind of had to come together in like a perfect storm for yeah. it to finally bear out, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone like and subscribe. And uh, we're going to put out a lot of good content this um, summer. I was going to say great content, but I'm going to lower the expectations. That's what I think <laughs> you said, Maven, somewhere. Yeah. Um, John Delin's lower interview. The and then when John Delin gave you a glowing, you know, introduction. And you're oh. like, let's uh, let's lower the bar a little bit <laughs> and see what happens. Okay. It's a good strategy. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.